Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this update for the Australia Day weekend for uh, global stocks and commodities. Uh, it's still business as usual, despite the fact that uh, we've now got a, um, uh, a, a fear campaign, if you like, or not campaign, but certainly fear around this coronavirus coming out of China. And I'm not um, attempting to understate the seriousness of that situation, but in terms of its impact on the stock market um, at this point in time, You've just got to conclude that it's going to be um, have no real lasting effect, just the same as um, the SARS virus uh, ten or twelve years ago, whenever it was, uh, really turned out to be a great buying opportunity. The the market got uh, very rocky there for for about a month, uh, but all it did was um, uh, provide better opportunities in in what was a um, an ongoing uptrend. And I think at the moment there's no reason to suspect that uh, that this will be any different. Uh, the bottom line is um, markets have become significantly overbought. There'd been uh, too much enthusiasm during January, and we quite often see a pullback in February when, that, when that's been the case. And I think uh, the overwhelming odds are we're going to see that again this time. Okay, so very quickly, shorter update this uh, this week, obviously being a long weekend, and, and really nothing much has changed at, at the big picture view. So the US market had become dangerously overbought. Uh, you'll see that very, very clearly on the chart. The price had uh, deviated well above the 50-day moving average. And uh, the sell-off on Friday uh, was, you know, the, it was put that the coronavirus was the cause of it. Look, it, was, it wasn't. It was just the trigger. Just it needed a trigger. Any trigger would do. And the, the coronavirus was, uh, was sort of, you know, rolled out by the media as being the culprit. But... Look, the market actually, as you'll see, opened higher on Friday. Now, the coronavirus has been around all week, and yet the, the market was still strong on Friday morning. And the reason that it opened so strongly in the US is because earnings reports are coming through really well, uh, particularly stocks like Intel and American Express, which we'll look at, uh, came out with great earnings reports. So the market is still um, really in, uh, in a strong uptrend, but it just really got too far ahead of itself. So from my perspective, last week's global uh, reality that I presented, that is that you can find holes if you want to go and look for them, but economically and fundamentally, things are good enough to sustain stock markets where they are and to sustain and advance in, uh, in the best stocks. And that's still, still going to be the case. So don't let the media throw you off in the next few weeks as the level of anxiety around the coronavirus uh, increases, as I'm sure it will. The media loves a good story. Portfolio analysts last week, uh, we reviewed what, what had been a really powerful week of gains for uh, particularly the 10-bagger portfolio in the week prior. So that was, uh, that was a very pleasing exercise when you can go through and look at some incredibly powerful weeks of, uh, of gains. And there was also a very broad array of stock uh, questions and general questions about, uh, about the market in general. Uh, it was probably the biggest week of questions I've had in the, in the uh, two and a half years I've been running the service. So that was great. Um, obviously, members are, are very engaged. American stocks, the S&P ended up falling 35 points on the week, but it was, um, <coughs> pardon me, it was all on Friday. So down 2% after, a, after actually gapping higher. But look, the, the gains had stalled uh, ahead of Friday. So that was really just a case of overbought and it had to come down. But the key point I want to make is that stocks that are beating expectations, and this is really the most important point I want to make this week, stocks that beat expectations and are coming through with earnings growth are still going to get rewarded. And when you see the charts of Intel and American Express, you'll see what I mean. There's also new highs for the NASDAQ, so there's a lot of positives out there. And the fact that Intel and American Express and quite a few others were able to rise on, uh, on a relatively weak day, um, you know, speaks to the overall health of the market. From a purely index point of view, if the S&P were to come down another 100 points down to the 50-day moving average, that would just relieve some of the overbought pressure it would be healthy, it would be good for the market. So I still see that we've got a buying opportunity potentially building. If there's a bubble, I think the bubble is in uh, defensive stocks. 
uh, utilities and, and the like. Um, you know, some of these stocks are trading on PE multiples of 30 and 40 with earnings growth uh, below 10% a year. Uh, so if there's a bubble, that's where it is. I don't believe it's necessarily in, um, in a lot of these tech stocks. The US dollar, uh, slight, edging slightly higher. That was really a flight to safety, which often happens when uh, things like global viruses are around. And we also saw a bit of a move into gold as well. Um, consolidating just below the trend channel on the, uh, on the US dollar. The 10-year yield, however, did uh, fall sharply down to 1.68. It had been trading up around the 1.82 mark. So a um, bit of a flight into bonds as well. So all that is, is pretty normal sort of activity. So here's the S&P, and you can see that by Wednesday, it really had got further above the 50-day moving average than it normally gets. Maybe it was similar to here on the 27th of November. You can see that we gapped higher on Friday, traded down, but clearly some buying support came in at the end. So I have no expectation that this is going to develop into anything significant. Now, from a purely technical point of view, if you look at when are the good opportunities, somewhere with the index getting down between the 50-day and the 200-day, between the red and the blue lines. Happened here again in August, uh, again in October. So a move down into this area here would be good technical entries. Now, whether that will occur at this point in time or not is, I mean, who knows. But um, it's, it's very much about individual stocks, so um, not too fussed about what the index does. Now, let's just look quickly at, so this is Intel. So you saw what Friday was like, quite a negative day. Uh, but look at Intel, good earnings results, and they were rewarded and rewarded very, very powerfully. And similarly with American Express. So the clear message here is go for growth, go for quality, uh, because the market's, irrespective of what else is going on around it, the market's going to reward those sort of stocks. So, um, yeah, that's that's the key point out of, um, uh, out of this week. So let's look at the US dollar. So we're just sort of bouncing around, just... We've, we've broken down from the trend channel. We've rallied back up to it, and we're still sitting around about the lower boundary of that trend channel. But as I've seen in recent weeks, Trump wants the US dollar lower, and we'll, we'll pull all the strings that he can. Uh, the futures market for currencies is positioned for a significantly lower US dollar. That doesn't mean that it has to go down, but certainly the powers that be are exerting influence to try and get the US dollar down. All right, moving on now to Aussie stocks. Uh, our dollar went down sharply, down to 68.2. That's a, a double banger result, really. The US dollar went slightly higher, but also just concerns over China, obviously, because we, um, you know, we export so much to China. Um, so we've got the battle here in Australia between a weak economy, um, and uh, you know we saw one of the German uh, supermarket giants, uh, Coughland, I think that's how you pronounce it, uh, which had spent five hundred million dollars gearing up to open up in Australia, hired a couple of hundred staff, and they basically made the decision to pull out of Australia before they opened their first store, and they cited basically our weak economy as uh, as the reason for it. So we've got clearly a weak economy. On the other side, however, we're at the part of the cycle where commodity prices could continue to rise and possibly a weak US dollar. So we may end up just going nowhere with the Australian dollar, saying, staying somewhere in this um, high 60 cent area as those two opposing forces balance out. Uh, the A6200 ended up up 26 points, 0.3 of a percent, but you can be assured it will be down uh, on Tuesday unless there is a significant turnaround in the US dollar tonight. Uh, sorry, in the US stock market tonight. <clears throat> Healthcare and materials uh, have been leading the way in the Australian market. Uh, banks have been weak. Um, industrials have been relatively weak. And it's a fairly bleak outlook for banking. Um, there's a long list of headwinds. They include 
the technical disruptors that are nibbling at their heels. Uh, we've got ongoing pressure on margins from just many, many sources. Uh, they're, they're regulatory. Uh, they're, they're coming from a number of different sources. The, uh, the fact that they've, they've got very low provision for bad debt, which means they don't have anything to write down. Um, there's low credit growth. Um, so things not looking at all good for um, for the Australian banking system. However, that hasn't stopped it going higher, and it's now at a valuation which I think is of considerable risk. So there's the ASX 200. We managed to break out above the all-time highs uh, around 6,900, and um, I think you'll see that come down on Tuesday. If we look at the finance index, you can see that we've basically flattened out. We've been in consolidation now for some time, uh, and the the banking index is basically below its 200-day moving average. Um, we've seen some strength in Commonwealth Bank in particular, but the valuation now of Commonwealth Bank is now at a historical high at a time when I th think the, the headwinds have never been stronger. So those two things don't really go together. Turning to precious metals, gold rose $14. There was a bit of a flight to safety uh, because of the virus, up to fifteen seventy one. Um, the big picture trend, as you'll see in, in uh, gold, is up. There's no question about that. We're in a shorter-term corrective phase, and I think there is still the potential for this to go lower yet uh, for the reasons around the, uh, the overhang in the futures market, which I've talked about every week now for a couple of months. Um, so that battle is still being played out. Precious metal stocks just continuing sideways. So I don't think it's time yet to expand your holdings into um, into gold stocks. So let's look quickly at gold. Uh, so on a daily basis, this is where I think we're at. We had a consolidation. So this was an important resistance level through here at 15, just under 1550. So that's an important long-term resistance level. We rallied up to it in September. We came back to the highs, which had been formed in, in July, which is pretty normal. So this has been behaving itself from a technical perspective very nicely. We've now advanced. We managed to get a bit of a blow-off high on the 8th of January, up at 1612. We've now pulled back to the breakout. And it's possible that this will just go up from here. But it's also possible that we may get the traditional ABC correction. So there's our A leg down, B leg weak bounce, C leg to the downside. Now, is the C leg going to be a very shallow C leg or is it going to be a deeper C leg? I have no idea. Don't really care. But we, go, we may get a, a leg to the downside. But then I believe after that, once that, that ABC correction is complete and that could take another couple of weeks, then I believe there's every reason to suspect that the main trend, which is up, look at the 200-day moving average, look at the 50-day moving averages above it, and the price is above both of them. So the orientation is to the upside. There's just no argument about that whatsoever. So I think there's then a chance that, um, that gold will then reassert its main uptrend. And... Um, you know, who knows? We could uh, we could be back knocking on the door of the all-time highs uh, sometime throughout this year, which is up around the 1900 level. So when when you stand back and look at it from that perspective, it it really is pretty obvious about where the trend is. So you know, we can pontificate all we like about where the price of gold is going, but you can't deny the trend. Now, just turning quickly to GDX, so the main global uh, ETF. And we're really just going sideways. We've, we haven't broken out, unlike gold, we haven't broken out above uh, the August 2016 highs. Uh, and that's you know probably a reflection that the market's not convinced yet that um, the gold doesn't have a bit more downside in it yet. Other commodities, uh, copper was down sharply, down to 271. Uh, but that was mainly about the US dollar going up. But crude oil did come off. Closed at 50, down at 54.28, uh, 
and that was a combination mainly the China virus and anticipation about what that might mean for energy demand into China um, and also a bit of currency impact as well. Here's the spot copper chart so you can see just right over here on the right hand side you can see quite a sharp sharp move down in copper on uh, on uh, the last couple of days of the week is the nickel price has managed to hold its um, stable level. So wrapping it up, the, the message is this is an individual stock pickers market. If you are doing things by the traditional way, then uh, you know I, just, I don't know what sort of return you, you're likely to get, but I don't think it's going to be overly attractive and it's not going to be anything like what you can get by being a, uh, an individual stock picker. So objective, unbiased uh, research is being very, very handsomely rewarded, and there's um, there's certainly uh, you know plenty of evidence in the uh, in the Australian small cap market of stocks that have gone up by two, three, four fold in in the last uh, six to twelve months. So I think uh, you need to let go of the old portfolio standards, the old uh, ways of doing things. You know we have a bit of Telstra and we have some of BHP and Real. We have the banks and bit of West Farmers and you know if we do that we'll, we'll all be good well I think that that landscape has changed quite considerably so open up your mind to new ways of doing things I think high probability uh, growth is is the real prize because yes you may get added volatility in uh, in those sort of stocks but at least if they continue to grow the price will recover and it will go up, and that's more than can be said for some uh, some other areas of the market, particularly the low growth areas, like the, some of the utilities and and uh, infrastructure stocks that are that are not only low growth but they're also um, extremely overvalued. Uh, portfolio analysts this week, I'll just be really focusing on uh, you know with so many good advances in the ten bagger portfolio for those that either don't have any or don't have a full allocation to those stocks just how we go about getting into them and then and then managing them as they be, become increasingly larger parts of people's portfolios all right that's it for this uh, holiday weekend there's my contact details for any non-members and I'll be back with you next week cheers